In this video, we're going to create a hybrid game engine with ray marching. Now, ray marching is a powerful technique that is being used a lot in video games to render clouds, smokes, reflections, and other cool things. But you can use it to render 3D objects using a technique called sphere tracing. Now, the amount of games that get shipped every year with this technique is zero, simply because sphere tracing is too slow. So today we're going to build a hybrid solution. We're going to take our normal game engine, which has a character controller with physics, and we're going to create a ray marching engine separately, and then we're going to combine these two to get the final result. So all of this should be super duper easy, right? Right. So we're going to take our normal engine and add a post-processing shader. This shader is going to run for every single pixel on the screen. We can sample the color of the rendered image and display it as the final color. Now, if we subtract that color from one, we can invert the color. So we have full control over the colors of our pixels. So now, let's implement ray marching. But first, we need to understand how sphere tracing works. Imagine that you're blind in a room with some objects. Now, I'm God, and I'm going to tell you that the distance to the nearest surface is 5 meters. Now, that's not a lot of information, but we're going to know for sure that we need to move 5 meters forward, at least, in order to touch something. So you're going to move 5 meters forward, and I'm going to tell you again that the nearest surface is 2 meters away. So you're going to do what you did last time, because if you move any less than 2 meters, you know for sure that you're not going to touch something. And you're going to repeat that until you get to the surface, or you just get tired and give up. This is how ray marching works, but instead of one person, all of the pixels on your screen are going to move forward. So you start with the camera position and you pick a ray direction based on the position of the pixel on the screen. Now we're going to come back to this line later, but let's move forward for now. So you're going to march forward in a loop and call the SDF function to get the nearest surface's distance to you. Now when the distance is less than this epsilon value, you know that you've hit something. So for now, I'm just going to draw white on the pixels of the screen. Now for the sign distance function of our scene, we're going to pick a cube's SDF. And all we have to do is define an origin and the size of the cube. Now, if we take a look at the result, we can notice that something has went wrong. And this wasn't too hard to figure out because the ratio of the width and height of the box doesn't match what we have in the code. So to fix this, you need to take the aspect ratio of the camera into account. So all you have to do is multiply the UV.X by the aspect ratio. To test the result, I'm going to add another cube with the same position and size to our normal engine, which renders triangles. Now, if you take a look at the result, the two cubes do not match. And when you move or rotate the camera, it's even worse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update the camera's position to match the camera position in our normal engine. And to fix the camera's rotation, we can apply the camera's quaternion to the ray direction. And to make things a little bit simpler, we can put all of this code into a get camera to pixel function. Now, if we run this, we can see the result has improved, but the cubes still don't match. And that's because we've overlooked a very important implementation detail. Ray direction equals a three-dimensional vector with UV as its X and Y components and 1 as its Z components. Now, naturally, I experimented a little bit with this number and arrived at the number 1.3. Now, 1.3 makes everything look perfect in our scene. Why is that? What is 1.3? In this point, I can move forward and, you know, not care about this number, but that's not how engineering works. So I went into a deep thought to understand where this number comes from. So let's take a look at a simplified version of the problem. I have two cubes and I have two scenes. And for the sake of simplicity, for the rest of this video, I'm going to call these scenes the real and virtual scenes. The real one is the one that is rendered using triangles, and the virtual one is the one that is rendered using ray marching. I also have two cameras which need to render their scenes. Now, if our cubes have the same position and size, then why is there an inconsistency between the two renders? You guessed it, the two cameras need to have the same settings. Now, to fix this, we need to explore how perspective cameras work. 
Let's say we have a camera in space that is looking at a certain direction. Now, in computer graphics, we have this concept of a near and far plane, simply because the computer is not able to handle infinite precision. So we need to limit the rendering area in order to avoid these precision issues. Now, if we draw the lines that go from the camera to the four corners of the far plane, this is going to shape the camera's viewing frustum. And we can also change the angle between these four lines, which is called the field of view of the camera. Now, in real cameras, we have this concept of an image plane, which forms behind the camera. But in 3D graphics, this doesn't exist, and the image plane is simply imaginary. But for simplicity, we're going to assume that it's on the near plane for the rest of this video. So if we move the near plane forward, the object will no longer be in the viewing frustum, and as a result, we won't render it. But this description of the perspective camera doesn't quite align with how the camera in Raymarching works. Now, because I was confused about this 1.3 number, I deleted the get camera to pixel function and decided to rethink and rewrite it. So let's think about the camera's viewing frustum again. The rays that we're gonna shoot are all going to be inside the viewing frustum of the camera. So let's consider the four rays that are going to hit the corners of the far plane. Now, if we extend all of our rays far enough, we can assume that every ray is going to hit the far plane somewhere in the middle. So with that key piece of information in mind, we can again assume that every single ray is going to hit the far plane in some world position. And now if you calculate that world position, we can subtract the camera's position from that, normalize the result, and get the ray direction that we want. So now all we have to do is calculate the far plane's size, use this algorithm to get the world position of the intersection point, and then normalize it to get our ray direction. Notice that we don't need to subtract the camera's position here, simply because this vector is already positioned relative to the camera. And now everything works beautifully. By the way, if you're still curious about what that magic number was, 1.3, you can calculate it with this algorithm. Notice how it takes the field of view of the camera into account. Now, I found this algorithm in a game that form way after I found my original solution, but both functions are mathematically correct and will give you the same result. Alright, so now, after rather a lot of work, we can render some objects correctly. So now let's use some of the cool powers of ray marching and merge the geometry of our cube with the objects in the scene. So I'm going to add a sphere that is going to intersect with our cube and for this to work we need to have the SDF of our scene. Now Unreal Engine calculates the SDF and stores it in a 3D texture but that's simply too much work. So instead of that we're going to do a simple trick. By having the camera's depth texture, we know the depth of every single pixel. So we can use that with the ray direction that we calculated to get the world position of all the pixels. And we can always calculate the distance to that world position, and that's how our SDF of the real scene is going to look like. Now, I know that this isn't mathematically correct, but we can use this fake SDF to do what we want. So we can smoothly merge the geometries of our virtual cube and the real scene by using this smooth min function which I grabbed from IQ's website. Now this is all very cool but I'm getting tired of seeing white as the color of my pixel. Let's add some lighting and let's make this look a little bit better. So I'm going to gather all the lights in the scene in an array and add some lighting. For lighting though, we need normals, and we can calculate those easily by sampling the SDF a couple of times. Now remember that we're using a fake SDF for the real scene, so the normals at the edges of the blending aren't going to always look right. But that's fine, we can hide those using some coloring tricks. Let's consider looking at the water for example. If you look at the water at a 90 degree angle, you're going to see all the rocks under it. But if you look at it at a low angle, you're going to see reflections. This is called the Fresnel effect, and we can calculate the Fresnel factor using the normals, which tells us at what angle we're looking at the pixel. Now, we can use that to add some reflections. And finally, we can calculate a soft edge around the areas that get merged with the scene, and use that to softly fade the edges of our object. Now, we can make this look a lot better by blending the colors of our objects. 
By refactoring our code to use the surface struct, we can store more information about the color, specular color, and the shininess of our object. Then we can write a new smooth min to handle merging these surfaces. But blending with the color of our real scene doesn't really look good, so let's just blend between the colors of our virtual objects. Finally, we can add some wobbly noise to our spheres to push the distances to the spheres around in the direction of the normals. Keep in mind that we can calculate the normals of the spheres very easily because it's just a vector from the center of the sphere that goes to the surface of the sphere. Next, I can add some physics to the spheres and push them around. And let's add a shooting impulse to the collider whenever the player clicks the mouse, making sure to push the object in the camera's viewing direction. And now I can shoot some blobs around. Fantastic. But unfortunately, as the number of these blobs grow, the slower my game becomes. And at this point, I'm thinking about implementing some performance optimization tricks. So while researching, I came across this paper called Enhanced Sphere Tracing, and the idea of it is very simple. Sometimes when we shoot our rays, our rays get really close to the surface of an object, but never touch it. We can speed up this process though by increasing the real nearest distance just by a little bit. And this way we can sample less points along the way, but this means that if we get to an object, we're going to pass right through it. And to handle this case, we're going to check if the sign distance to the nearest surface is negative. And if it is, that means that we're inside the object. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back one step and from that point use the real distances again. Quick pause here, so I just want to quickly point out that my approach doesn't match the approach of the authors of the paper. And this is simply because my approach doesn't give you a perfect image. And there are some edge cases that we're not handling here, such as the ray going through the object because the object is too thin. Now, even though my approach isn't perfect, it produces near perfect results for this specific game. And so I just went with the huge performance boost because the artifacts weren't a big deal. Now, back to the video. We can also increase the epsilon value in every iteration by just a little bit. And that seems to give us pretty much the same result, but with better performance. And now, after implementing these optimization tricks, the frame rate improved by a considerable amount without sacrificing too much quality. Now, to be honest, I've kept one secret away from you this entire time. Everything you saw in this video is built on the web, which means you can go ahead and click on one of the links in the description to play the game in your browser. And that's all I have to say. I really hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. And if you did learn something new, leave a like and subscribe to my channel. I produce a lot of 3D graphics related content and you can check one of my shader tutorials here if you want to get started with shaders and one of my roadmap videos here if you want to start learning 3D graphics and 3GS, which is the rendering engine I used here. And with that, I'll catch you guys in the next videos.